dealt with these themes of wanting to abandon his post and wanting to not pilot the Gundam because every time he got in the Gundam, he was kind of traumatized and he deals with that PTSD and the uh, fallout of those events over, the, over like the next 20 years in the story of Gundam. Um, this was very much what something that they wanted to emulate in uh, Evangelion. They basically took that early arc and said, okay, what if it was Amuro except where he had no good adults around him? What if it was Amuro if everyone like didn't want to support him? Um, and that's where Shinji comes out of partially. Um, so I think we get we get to the second part of our uh, presentation, which is Evangelion airing. The original plan, uh, Evangelion had some aspects of it that were that did come out in the final product, but a lot of it didn't necessarily. The ending was originally different. It was still going to be kind of apocalyptic and uh, wide ranging, but it, it was never going to be the sort of everyone on a blue ball clapping. Um, it was going to be about a instrumentality actually failing, and it was actually going to be about uh, an angel attacking from the moon, and then I'm going to deal with that. Um, but that changed for reasons we'll get into later. The theme of not running away was something that Anna really wanted to touch upon. Um, he wrote and directed in Yelling, and I should qualify that if anyone's not familiar. Uh, and he said that he really wanted to make this a central theme of the story. And we see this a lot, especially in the early series and again towards the, towards the uh, end of Evangelion. Um, this, the anime, not the movie. Um, Anno also wanted to try and help create more otaku. He wanted to try and spread the uh, influence of anime wider. Which is weird because Anno, as we all know, is that guy who's like, oh man, otaku suck. But <laughs> he was also like, you know, it'd be really cool if more people were into anime and respected it as an art form. That's what he wanted to try and do with Evangelion. Um, also, the Ava units were too complicated to make toys out of. But they were all like, "Listen, dude, can we just make it a little more blocky, a little more simple? Like, you know, look at look at Tomino. He's making he's making lots of money off of that. Why would we do that more like that?" But uh, the Ava Yelling comp the units they kept their really complex design for good reasons. I think they're really great. Um, that was sort of like the goal where they were trying to go for. They also wanted to they were they're, they're trying to figure out like what's the best way to market the show because it, it's very, it's very, it is definitely an alternate timeline where Evan Yelling was an OVA series and not an anime, a TV anime. But uh, they were like, no, more people are going to watch this if it's a TV anime. Um, it's, so it's because we all assume that anime, that anime is for a general audience back in the day, and they were like, okay, we'll do this. Oopsie. Um, so the initial reception was that Evangelion was not as like super popular as it was today or even at the end of its run. Um, it was extremely just like, oh yeah, there's that show, I guess. It didn't have a bunch of, of fanfare, it didn't have like any super big names attached to it except for maybe Anno, but I'm not, I don't really have a really good grasp on how Anno was respected in the time before Evangelion, so I can't really speak to that. But it was not a big deal show. I believe it was a late night, late night airing. Um, it grew slowly in popularity because of word of mouth. A lot of people were like, hey, dude, like, there's this Evangelion show. It's really cool with like super robots, but like his dad's a jerk, and uh, there's this cute girl in it named Ray, and Asuka, she's rude, she's great. Um, and that was kind of where uh, that came out of. It was just a lot of people being, oh, dang, Evangelion's really good. And you started seeing even wider audiences, not people who were just watching things that late at night, but that general audience was tuning into this and being like, oh, cool, a new thing, because nobody knew where this is going. Nobody read the manga. Nobody knew where this, like, where the end of the story was going to be. It was an adventure. Um, but there were there were complications <laughs> in this plan and in, uh, laying it out. So, what were those complications that really ended up changing how Evangelion uh, was ended up being? It was not the religious imagery. A lot of people in the Western uh, uh, sort of audience. The Western imagery is a lot more controversial here than it was in Japan. Um, I, I talked about this earlier, like, you know, crosses are just like, you know, supernatural shorthand. But, uh, yeah, no one really cared. It was like, oh, cool, a cross. That's neat. Um, what was controversial was the heavy, like, what was complication was, I can't talk today. What was, uh, what complicated was this heavy fan pressure. Like I said, Evangelion got really popular with their word of mouth. They were really trying to live up to the uh, reputation they cultivated with their with their fans, um, and they were like, "Crap, we gotta get we gotta make the best thing we can. We gotta do as much as we can." Um, but we had, they had a lot of budget problems. Um, they just, they burned they burned through a lot of their pay early on. They burned through um, they just did not have all, as much money as they should have had 
had. There, in another world, there is, an, there is a world where Evangelion was fully funded and it's completely different. I'd love to see that world. Um, but there was a lot of issues with there. There's also a lot of controversies that sw like started swirling around Evangelion um, during its airing, like episode 18's like Bardiel fight. Uh, so there was this is like this is that this is when Evangelion got really really popular, and they were like, yeah. So Ano, like in your last episode, like an Evangelion unit ate something, and it was scary as heck. Like. <laughs> What are we doing? So there's a, lot, there's a lot of public outcry of like, this is something the kids can be watching. Why is he like ripping out the thing's innards and like devouring it while like a really like sappy song plays in the background? What's going on? Um, and this was like one of those big early things that really started happening. This is because the people at Gynax were feeling the pressure. They were very much like, listen, we don't have the time. We don't. We, but either we stop this show, we stop making this show, or our stress is going to bleed through in the show. And they end up deciding to keep on making the show and being like, "You're going to see some stuff, guys. You're going to see some stuff." Which is why we start seeing these, a lot of these really avant-garde, really minimalistic kind of uh, editing and direction and animation tricks that weren't really in vogue at the time. Um, they specifically just wanted to say, like, we need something we can make that's cool and different, we, we don't have a whole bunch of time. So they wanted to try and make things that were low effort, but high on concept. Um, and, that, and this is part of those reasons, one of the reasons why there's such a high pressure and such controversy surrounding Evangelion was that violent scene. Also, the uh, Kaji and Masato explicitly had sex in episode 20. Um, I believe it was, it wasn't on screen, but it was, you know, heavily implied. Um, and again, this is that situation of, kids can be watching this dude, why are you, why are you doing this? Um, I want to say, I have been able to find a source on this, but I want to say this is one of the first like, major um, like, sex scenes between uh, of this kind in the animation, like the TV animation uh, world. Um, but I, I've heard that, but I've never been able to like, hunt down a uh, source on that. So, grain of salt, please. Anyways, these complications end up creating the show that, that and that ended up being made. Like I said, they chose things that were like really high on punch and concept, but maybe not high on effort. And people are not necessarily receptive, receptive towards art that doesn't obviously take a whole bunch of time, like or skill, as they see it. Um, you, you see this a lot in the, in the uh, response to modern art. I'll be like, oh, anybody could like splash a bunch of black on a page and be like, oh, it's so deep, but. You might not. You probably wouldn't have had that idea to do that. Like modern art ha is challenging. It's weird, and it's ne not necessarily aesthetically easy to consume. And Avon Yelling was definitely not easy to consume, especially in the later parts where they started running out of their budget and it take a lot less time on uh, animation. And those cool robot fight scenes kind of started going away, and they started using these really weird tricks, like you know, staying on a single frame for a full minute. Which I think was actually a really cool thing, but I can totally see why no one else would like that. Um, this again, this is this change for either better or for worse. I would really like to see like a quick show of hands. Who thinks that this has changed for the better? All right, who would have liked to see it as it was originally intended? All right, so about fifty-fifty with some people, some people abstaining, like the election. Um, <laughs> So this is so you know, and that's when Avon Gallion aired. There's this whole bunch of outcry. The people are, people are writing in. We've all heard the stories about like Gainax receiving death threats and all that, um, which, in a more series centric uh, panel, I'll definitely get more into that. Of like, here's how this changed in the Avon Gallion, how they changed this, and da 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 da. But we're talking about the impact in the industry. Um, now I mentioned earlier how I noticed a lot of people like having like character-based merchandise here, and you can definitely thank Evangelion for that. Like I said earlier, most anime merchandise was cool ships and cool toys and cool weapons. You didn't get like a, a shirt with your favorite character on it. Um, who here has bought something from the dealer's room today with their favorite character on it? Yeah. Good. You can thank these two for that. Um, Asuka and Ray sold enormous amounts of merchandise. Enormous amounts. These two pushed so much dosh into the Dynax vault. 
that uh, Ray was actually called the premium girl by publishers because they could put her face on a book and it would sell out. Um, <laughs> Ray was popular. Um, th this was um, this was the first time that we had seen. The, I don't think this is the first time character-based merchandising was ever made. For sure, it was the first time that it was so successful. And everybody else was like, "Hey, Gainax is making lots of money. Can we do that too?" Um, and they started. That's why we started seeing this trend towards, you know, just slap their waifu on it. They'll buy it. Um, <laughs> And that's when we started seeing a lot of that happening. And again, this was, this was stuff that was actually marketed at an adult otaku audience, which makes you kind of wonder, I don't, I don't want to make all this uh, otaku again. Maybe it's to sell them stuff. Hmm, you don't know. Um, but like, again, this is something that was marketed towards an adult audience, to a collector audience, to an otaku audience, not to kids. Necessarily. Some kids, I'm sure, were into it. Um, this also helped to popularize certain character archetypes. Um, which we all know now today as Q and Tsudere. Um, now, Asuka and Rei were definitely not the, uh, they were not the first ones to be in this character archetype. Uh, the first Tsundere of note is probably the Lum Invader from uh, Urasa Yatsura. Um, and she's great, um, but she was like that person who was like, oh, you know, baka, and slap somebody, or <laughs> does some, some slapstick for like, paying attention to another woman, or whatever they do. Um, and so that's where she kind of came out of. Um, the Tsundere is probably the one that's least changed by the archetype. Uh, Asuka definitely helped to popularize it, but she didn't make a, as much of a big change on it as Rey did um, on her own archetype. Uh, I can never know how to pronounce this name. Maitel, Maitel? It's Maitel. Maitel, thank you. Uh, Maitel from uh, Galaxy Express 999, which was a Leiji uh, Matsumoto uh, manga and then an later anime. She really has that first notable example of someone who was like really cold but had emotions on the inside. Um, but she was expressively let's talk, kind of just stoic and really not very expressive. Um, Ray was someone who was explicitly, at least to some degree, emotionless, um, which is why Ray had a much bigger change on the archetype than Asuka did. Um, Ray was very, like, in the decade or so after that, we saw a lot of people who were like, oh, she's an emotionless girl, and she has no emotions, she's just a, she's just a doll. That's all right, that's all right. And you know, eventually the, uh, the main character like kisses her, and she's like, oh, I have emotions now. Yeah, and, and I could do an entire panel on the feminist implications of that one. Uh, but the, um, the thing there was like, again, uh, Oscar really helped popularize this, and we saw a lot more tsundere uh, archetypes coming into the forefront and shows after this, because they were like, oh man, I love it when a girl punches me and calls me an idiot. This is great. Um, but and then, but like Ray was the really one, the one that really helped to uh, change that Kudere archetype to what we know it nowadays. That's where we got Yuki Nagato from uh, Haruhi Suzumiya. That's where we got Yin from Dark of the Black, um, and so on and so forth. Um, now you remember how a lot of shows were not really like based more on. Uh, manga and novels, and they're basically made for, um, you know, just made for a general audience. That changes now. Um, everyone was like, oh man, Evangelion made a lot of money. It's very influential, it's very powerful. What if we did more experimental stuff in the TV space? Experimental anime always existed. That was in the OVAs, usually, in with films, but there was experimentation in, uh, in anime, TV anime, absolutely. I don't want to say that like everyone who worked in TV anime was just like a... Uh, a money-making drone. I don't want to say that. I don't respect anyone's like artistic integrity by saying that. But this is back when it became more vogue to let your directors do what they wanted. Um, this is where series like um, Serial Experiments Lane can, comes out of um, that kind of like really minimalistic visual style with a lot of like postmodern um, future thinking, cyberpunk themes. Those came out of it as a direct response to the market created by Evangelion. Um, and also the runs were shorter in order to accommodate this um, for a couple reasons. One of them was like, you want to have an end point if you're making an important show. Um, you want to have like a point where you can say like, hey, this is where we're going to end, this is where we're going to make our point and we're done. And it's also because you can't retain that really niche genre audience over the course of 500 episodes without changing a lot of things um, over time. And so a lot of people were like, let's just, give them a small contract for this amount of episodes, 
So we saw less and less 50 episode um, sort of packages being given out to creators. Um, and now obviously some series, especially ones that are more based on like marketing and the uh, and adaptations, they were able to keep their really long runs. They were able to keep their 50 episode, 100 episode runs. Um, but original anime especially was mostly related to having these shorter 12, 13 to 26 episode runs. Um, also, we were able to see a lot more creative control being lent to creators. Um, this was a situation where like, they realized they didn't have to necessarily make it all on toys. They were like, okay, we see you're going with something pretty cool here, and we're gonna we're gonna trust you on this. And if you're able to make us a lot of money, then go for it. Uh, this is this is kind of like an example of like uh, what Sunrise did with Cowboy Bebop. Um, Cow uh, Sunrise was like, hey, all we really need is to, you to have some ships. We don't have like requirements of you like having uh, robots and a bunch of different changes or whatever. We just need to have some sort of ships, and you can do whatever you want. You can do anything. And then uh, Shinichiro Watanabe was like, anything? <laughs> uh, and that's why we got the, the genre-bending weirdness that is Cowboy Bebop out of that. Um, so the more direct influences in anime that we can see is that we, in the next decade or so, was that we saw a lot more of these Ray and Asuka likes. I talked about that earlier on their own slide. Um, so that people who were like very much just like, let's try and tap into the same gold mine that uh, Ray and Asuka kind of buried for the world. Um, we saw a lot of really dark and psychological plots being taken out into this world right now. Um, we had shows like Here and Now, Now and Then. Um, now and Then, Here and Now and Then, Here and Then. I'm, I'm running like four hours of sleep, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is like this really dark, really uh, gritty TV anime. We had shows like, again, Zero Experiments Lane, which was all about like, instead of being a show about cute anime girls, it was more about like, hey, cute anime girls, but also what is existence and what is humanity and where are we all, do we all real? What's the, what does the internet mean for this? What are, and that was, that, that stuff came out of this place that we were able to open up thanks to Evangelion. Um, again, more experimental animation was able to come out of the atmosphere created by Evangelion. I, again, I don't want to say that experimental animation did not exist before Evangelion. Absolutely not. It absolutely did. But Evangelion was the one that helped make it more fashionable, more profitable, and they were able to make more money off of doing it. They were able to say, like, hey, do that weird, th the, do that weird episode, that, that weird, like, scene where, like, everyone is uh, silhouettes and they're all up against, like, a white background or whatever. This is where we got, like, the, all the weird sort of, like, um, visual stuff of revolutionary girl Utna out of. It's where we got a lot of stuff of, um, again, I keep going back to it, but Serial Experiments Lane. A lot of her stuff was based on Evangelion's sort of inspiration. Um, oh, and here's all those examples I just talked about. Great. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Razafon. Um, I want to talk about Razafon just real quick. A lot of people in the Western world imagine that, uh, think that Razafon is just, oh, it's that Evangelion ripoff, right? Um, kind of? Not really. Uh, Evangelion was influential on Razafan, but it was, and it helped really create this sort of, uh, there was a lot of like plot points and aesthetics that were lifted partially from Evangelion. There's like, oh, there's the mysterious girl, there's the Masato kind of character who like lives with them and maybe has a crush on him. Um, there was this, there was a lot of that going on, um, but that is more so to do with uh, brave writing or super, it's writing, uh, excuse me, um, in the early 70s. Uh, that was more so where they took their uh, inspiration from, which was a early Tomino work, and they were able to just like they were looking at that and taking more themes from that show and a lot more ideas out of that show, things that didn't really exist in Evangelion. This was a lot more about um, themes of transcendence and rebirth and Mayan uh, mythology used as sort of like a visual touchstone rather than uh, Judeo-Christian mythology. Okay, so now we're going to get into shows and works that reference Evangelion. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no, I'm not doing that. Um, Evangelion is definitely like, you know, like, there are very few shows that are visually referenced as much as Evangelion, just because it's very easy to do. Um, SAO did it once. Um, uh, I know Monogatari has done it a lot of times. They've done it explicitly several times. It's like, hey, stop referencing Evangelion. Um, Monogatari is weird. Um, this is a, you, you can have two characters be positioned in a certain way in, in, uh, in an elevator, and they're like, oh, 
That's that scene. Um, but you know, everyone watched Evangelion when they were young, and they were like, let's 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 emulate that. It's kind of like Akira and the bike uh, animation, which we've all we've all seen gifs of that. It's kind of in the same sort of tier. So we're gonna dip in the last 15 minutes about the way that Evangelion helped to change uh, the way that anime was perceived, received, and responded to uh, by the mainstream culture and also the academic culture of the time. So, um, Evangelion did not do this alone. They did not change the perception of uh, anime as an academic subject alone. Princess Mononoke was released two years afterwards in 1997, um, and it was also the one that brought up a lot of really that was uh, bringing up a lot of really difficult and deep concepts about the environment and what we're doing with our world and how what our relationship to nature should be. Um, but more than just that, it was popular. It was real, real popular. Um, and I want to make sure that again, I'm not saying that challenging material didn't exist in anime or animation before. It absolutely did, but Mononoke and Aiden Yelling were the big ones that came out and like was on everyone's mind, they made money, and everyone's like, oh, this is a legitimate thing that we can talk to in an academic way. So we started seeing a lot of more like academic responses and critiques coming out of anime, especially in Japan at the time, and also in uh, America, um, as this became more and more of a big time import. Um, especially towards the late or towards the end of the uh, 1990s, when we started seeing things, uh, started seeing more anime being uh, brought onto Cartoon Network late at night. Not just Dragon Ball Z and Pokemon and uh, Sailor Moon, but things like you know Zoids and Big O. Okay. Um, we started seeing a lot of really um, more, sort of more response to this in the uh, academic community, both in America and Japan. It helped also to legitimize anime as an art form. It was one of those things of like, oh, you're an animator. I mean, you make stuff for kids, right? No, I'm an animator, and my ideas have more worth. Again, this was not like the hard and fast rule across the entire society. It was just like sometimes that you had this deal. You still do, but not as much anymore. So, uh, Ava's place in Japanese memory. This is, uh, I've seen some people compare it to being Japanese Star Wars. Um, in that it's the sort of thing of like everyone, not everyone's watched Star Wars, but everyone knows Star Wars on sight. Everybody knows the, no, I am your father line. Um, everyone knows, you know, it's Luke Skywalker, he's got a lightsaber, he does some things. And this is kind of like where we see uh, Evangelion, especially in Japan being, of just, that's that thing that everyone kind of knows. Not everyone in Japan's watched it, but you know, they know about it. Um, the merchandise remains popular in Japan. This is partially because of the rebuild movies coming out in the 2010s to help really re revitalize the fandom, but uh, it was still popular before then. Like you would still go in 2008 and stuff. You would still go into a shop in Tokyo and be like, "Oh, cool! There's Ray. There's Asuka," because they're still making money. Um, so also, Cruel Angels, a Cruel Angels oh, thesis, a Cruel Angel, a Cruel Angels thesis. Wow. I, 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 I said it right the first time, but I wrote it wrong. This is why you don't do this in a caffeine haze on the first week of school, by the way. Um, so this is still a very popular uh, opening. I think it's like one of the best openings of all time, hands down. Yes, uh, it's, extremely, it's extremely well produced, it's extremely well uh, made, it's extremely well like just paced with the show. Um, it's actually, in 2014, it was the 10th most popular karaoke